Chapter 10, Network Topology Networks play a role in nearly all facets of our daily lives, particularly when it comes to transport. Even within the transport realm lays a relatively broad range of different network types such as air networks, freight networks, bus networks, and train networks, not to mention the accompanying power and communication networks. We also have the ubiquitous street network, which not only defines how you get around a city, but provides the form upon which our cities are built and experienced. Cities are just social networks embedded in space. Around the world, good street networks come in many different geometrical configurations, ranging from the medieval patterns of cities like Prague and Florence to the organic networks of Boston and London and the planned grids of Washington, D.C. and Savannah, Georgia. But how do researchers begin to understand and quantify the differences in such networks? The primary scientific, in the primary scientific field involved with the study of shapes and networks is called topology. Based in mathematics, topology is a subfield of geometry that allows one to transform a network via stretching or bending. A network that has been stretched like a clock in a Salvador Dali painting would be congruent with the original unstretched network. This would not be the case in conventional Euclidean geometry where differences in size or angle cannot be ignored. The transport sector typically models networks as a graph of nodes and links. The node, or vertex, is the fundamental building block of the model. Links, or edges, are not independent entities, but rather are represented as connections between two nodes. Connectivity, and the overall structure of the network that emerges from the connectivity, is what topology is all about. In other words, topology cares less about the properties of the objects themselves and more about how they come together. For instance, if we look at the topology of a light rail network, the stations would typically be considered the nodes and the rail lines would be the links. In this case, the stations are the actors in the network and the rail lines represent the relationship between the actors. Those relationships, and more specifically, those connections, embody what is important. Taking a similar approach with a street network, we might identify the intersections as the nodes and the street segments as the links, as shown in the network above based on an early version of Metropolis. For most street networks, however, the street segments are just as important as the intersections, if not more so. The space syntax approach takes the opposite or dual approach with street networks. The nodes represent the streets, and the lines between the nodes, that is the links or edges, are present when two streets are connected at an intersection, as shown using the same metropolis network in figure 10.1. Initial theories related to topology trace back to 1736 with Leonard Euler and his paper on the seven bridges of Konigsberg. Graph theory-based topological measures first debuted in the late 1940s. The topological approach to measuring street networks, for instance, is primarily based on the idea that some streets are more important because they are more accessible, or in the topological vernacular, more central. We note that some streets are more important because they are wider, or they are wider because they are more important. This is considered in the hierarchy of roads. Related to connectivity, centrality is another important topological consideration. A typical Union station, so-called because it was a combined train station for different private railroads, is a highly central and important node because it acts as a hub for connecting several different rail lines. Some common topological measures of centrality include degree and betweenness, which we will discuss in more detail elsewhere. There are also some peculiarities worth remembering when it comes to topology. When thinking about the size of a network, our first inclination might be measures that provide length or area. In topological terms, however, size refers to the number of nodes in a network. Other relevant size-related measures include geodesic distance, the fewest number of links between two nodes, diameter, the highest geodesic distance in a network, and characteristic path length, the average geodesic distance of a network. Density is another tricky term in the topological vernacular. Earlier sections define traffic density and population density. When talking about density of a city, we usually seek out measures such as population density, intersection density, or land use intensity. In most cases, these metrics are calculated per unit area. In topology, however, density refers to the density of connections. In other words, the density of a network can be calculated by dividing the number of links by the number of possible links. Topologically, the fully gridded street networks of Salt Lake City, Utah, and Portland, Oregon, as shown in figures 11.3 and 11.4 respectively, are essentially the same. With respect to transport and urbanism, however, there remain drastic functionality differences between the 200-foot, 60-meter Portland blocks and the 660-foot, 200-meter Salt Lake City blocks. As illustrated with the Portland Salt Lake example, one limitation of topology is that it ignores scale. However, this can also be an advantage. For instance, Denver might be much closer to Springfield, Illinois than Washington, D.C. as the crow flies, 
but a combination of several inexpensive options for direct flights to D.C. and relatively few direct flights for Springfield mean that D.C. is essentially closer in terms of air network connectivity. Topology captures such distinctions by focusing on connectedness rather than length. While topological analyses such as the above are scale independent, we also need to be careful about the use of the term because scale-free networks are not equivalent to scale-independent analyses. In topological thinking, scale-free networks are highly centralized. More specifically, if we plot the number of connections for each node, the resulting distribution for what is known in topology as a scale-free network would resemble a power law distribution, with some nodes having many connections, but most having very few. A hub-and-spoke light rail system, for instance, tends to exhibit scale-free network qualities with relatively few stations connecting many lines. The nodes in a random network, on the other hand, tend to have approximately the same number of connections. For instance, when we define the intersections of a street network as the nodes and the segments of, as the links, the primal graph, the results tend towards a random network, where nodes have a similar number of entering and exiting links, degree. If we flip the definition again so that streets are the nodes and the intersections the links, the dual graph, we tend back towards a scale-free network, where a few nodes, or streets, connect many links, have many junctions but most nodes connect few links. One reason to look at connectivity in these terms has to do with the critical issues of resilience and vulnerability. In general, robustness is associated with connectivity. When we have good connectivity, removing one node or link does not make much of a difference in terms of overall network performance. In contrast, scale-free networks are more susceptible to strategic attacks, failures, or catastrophes. However, as shown in a recent paper about urban street network topology during a zombie apocalypse, Good connectivity could actually be a double-edged sword. Access depends on network speed, but also network distance. Distance is a product of the network's topological structure discussed in this chapter, and its geometric configuration and morphology, as well as how the network interactions are managed, treated in following chapters. 10.1. Graph The map is not the territory. Alfred Korzybski the graph is the stylized representation of a transport network for use in network analysis. It comprises nodes and links. The cartoon of Metropolis, figure 10.2, compared with the graph representations, figure 10.1, illustrates the point. A node or vertex typically is a junction or intersection between two roads, or any place that traffic can enter the network. Each node has a location in space typically denoted by latitude and longitude, or planar coordinates. There may also be a z-coordinate to identify elevation. Typically, each node has a unique identification number. In addition, nodes may have other attributes. On an idealized graph, nodes are points and have no size. In practice, junctions do have some physical size, so it may be desirable to measure that size. A link or edge is defined by two nodes and is directional. So the link from node I to node J differs from the link from node J to node I. Links have many attributes, including length, free flow speed, capacity, number of lanes or width, functional classification, in some, link performance function relating travel time to free flow speed, flow, and capacity. A more sophisticated analysis may consider the shape of links. The simple definition above implies that links are straight lines between two points. A turn can be defined by a sequence of three nodes at, from, to, and may be useful as the cost of making a left or right turn may differ from through movement at a junction. Centers are edges, links are spaces. In graphs, nodes are aspatial representation of the intersection of links, which themselves are aspatial representations of the structure of networks. However, real nodes like centers, places, and junctions, represented as spaceless points on the graph, take physical space. As such, they provide a spatial separation between areas that adjoin them. In addition to nodes standing in for places in their own right, centers serve as edges, in the sense of boundaries, not links, of adjoining neighborhoods. Similarly, links themselves are not one-dimensional objects, but at least two-dimensional, as we discuss in the chapter on streets. 10.2 Hierarchy Not all links or nodes are created equal, particularly when it comes to transport networks. In binary networks, the focus is on whether or not a connection between two nodes exists. However, when we know about the presence of a link as well as the strength of that link, it is called a valued or weighted network. For instance, when traveling from A to B in a street network, there is usually discontinuity in street type. In other words, one might move from a local street to a collector road to an arterial road and then back to a collector before reaching their destination. While engineers know this sort of differentiation as functional classification, it is also referred to as the hierarchy of roads. 
Hierarchy, which is embedded in many natural and societal systems such as biologic cells and the internet, is a common transport complexity that requires a more complicated topological analysis. Typical topological measures such as degree or betweenness can be useful in helping to understand network hierarchy, particularly in tree-like networks. However, such measures would fail to properly distinguish between streets in a gridded street network. In the figure 10.3 version of Metropolis Street Network, the major streets are represented by thicker lines and easily discerned, even in a gridded network. Using the basic set of topological metrics, we would have no idea that 8th Street is functionally different from 7th Street or F Street from D Street. These metrics fail to consider other attributes such as urban design, number of lanes, active transport infrastructure supporting walking and biking, adjacent land uses, and speed. Topology alone would not necessarily be able to distinguish such streets. Working with hierarchical networks often involves dividing networks in multiple layers or tiers. Measurements of heterogeneity have also become common proxies for characterizing hierarchy. To identify heterogeneity among street segments, researchers have used entropy measures as well as discontinuity measures. Discontinuity, for example, does not necessarily denote a disconnected network, rather the references to the discontinuity in moving from one street type to another. If we sum the number of times a traveler goes from one type of street to another while traveling along the shortest path route, we find the trip discontinuity. Dividing that number by the length of the trip gives us the relative discontinuity. Other simplistic hierarchy measures calculate the relative percentage of a particular type of road. For instance, we might divide the number or length of arterials by the total number or length of roads to find the relative percent arterials. Interestingly, it is not uncommon for large-scale transport models to delete the local streets on the lower end of the hierarchical spectrum for the sake of computational efficiency. Yet, removing such streets creates a bias against more connected networks because less connected networks typically need to be supported by major streets with more capacity than would be needed in more connected networks. Some topological researchers, where the focus should be on understanding the full network, unfortunately reach the same conclusion. Urban streets demonstrate a hierarchical structure in the sense that a majority is trivial while a minority is vital. If we only care about vehicle traffic flow, such statements may be true. However, our previous street network research confirms that understanding the full network holds the key to pushing toward improved safety, increased active transport, and better environmental and health outcomes. 10.3. Degree. How connected and how influential is a node within the overall network? Centrality measures help gauge the overall importance of a node. One of the simplest measures of centrality is degree, which measures the number of connections between a node and all other nodes. For instance, if we are considering a street network with intersections as nodes, a nodal degree of 4 would indicate a typical four-way intersection. Figure 10.4a renders the Metropolis Street Network with a degree value shown at each intersection in a four-way intersection highlighted in red. When we focus on what is happening at one particular node, it is called the ego network in that we are looking at the network from the perspective of a single node while ignoring all nodes not directly connected, which can be deemed a bit narcissistic. The entire network can be called the complete, whole, or global network. So, if we want an overall degree measure, we can calculate average degree, which is the average number of connections for all nodes within the overall network. When the average degree exceeds 1, every node has at least one connection on average. When the average degree approaches log n, where n equals the number of nodes in the network, Every node starts to become accessible from every other node. For the Metropolis network, there are 78 nodes with an average degree of 3.4. Analyzing degree measures for a complete network also entails generating a degree distribution, which literally equates to plotting the frequency of each degree for all the nodes shown in figure 10.4b for the Metropolis street network. The idea is to try to capture the relative differences in connectivity between the nodes in order to gain a sense of network structure. For instance, every node in a homogeneous network would have ex the exact same number of connections and not much of a distribution. A more centralized network might have one node with a high degree value and all other nodes with low degree values. 10.4 Betweenness Betweenness measures capture relative flow by quantifying the number of times a node or link is on a shortest path between two other nodes. Degree is often good for measuring local conditions but adequately characterizing centrality is a bit more complicated. When trying to figure out centrality in terms of how connected and influential a node or link is, it is useful to get a sense of relative network flow through a particular node or link. The first step would be to calculate the shortest path between every origin and every destination. Next, we count the number of times that a particular node or link shows up on a shortest path. 
The resulting number represents the relative role of a node or link as a connector between clusters of nodes or links. In figure 10.5, the intersection highlighted in red must be included in over half of the shortest paths. We call this count betweenness, which is essentially an attempt to quantify how necessary a node or link is to get from one side of the network to the other. The Panama Canal, for instance, is a key maritime link connecting the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. Without it, ships would have to route around the Cape Horn at the southernmost tip of Chile, or through the Straits of Magellan. For a ship traveling from New York to San Francisco, the Panama Canal, due to its high betweenness value, cuts more than 7,500 miles from this journey. In terms of other transport issues, betweenness usually relates to metrics such as accessibility and traffic congestion. In addition to revealing relative importance, betweenness also indicates how irreplaceable a node or link may be to a network. In other words, what happens if we remove a certain node or link from the network? Very high betweenness values can indicate a critical connection between various groups of nodes or links. In some cases, this represents a vulnerability where we would want to add redundancies to the network. In transport networks, if we assume all travelers take the shortest path and treat each traveler as having a unique origin and destination, betweenness is the same as the flow, number of travelers on the link. We could call this flow weighted betweenness. 10.5 Clustering When we have nodes or links with high betweenness values, it is often because our network is split into various subgroups that can be called clusters. Clusters tend to have their own unique set of properties so it is useful to be able to identify clusters quantitatively. While there are a growing number of clustering algorithms, the basic idea behind them is to capture the degree to which nodes cluster. The clustering coefficient, for instance, represents how likely it is that two connected nodes are part of a larger group of highly connected nodes. It can be calculated by dividing the number of actual connections between the neighbors of a node by the number of possible connections between these same neighboring nodes. For instance, in figure 10.6, the red node is the node of interest and has a degree of 4. Those four neighboring nodes make four actual connections with each other, as shown by the black lines in the figure on the right, but have six possible connections, shown by the black lines plus the red dashed lines. Thus, the clustering coefficient for the red node is 4 divided by 6, or 0 0.67. The value represented by the clustering coefficient ranges from 0, no clustering, to 1, complete clustering. If we are interested in the amount of clustering for an entire network, we average the clustering coefficients for all of the nodes. Clustering tends to be higher in real-world networks than in random networks. So when a network becomes more centralized so that a small percentage of nodes have high connectivity, the overall topology becomes more differentiated and clusters begin to emerge. Other related terms include component and clique. When a given subgroup of nodes is also highly connected, that is called a component. When the nodes in a component have a few connections with two other nodes outside of the component, that is a clique. Understanding clusters, components, and cliques in networks can be useful because they can hold more influence over behavior than overall network structure. Imagine, for instance, a new urbanist neighborhood with great street connectivity set into a city with poor overall street connectivity. Analyzing network structure for the overall city might lead us to one conclusion, yet we could find very different outcomes in the new urbanist neighborhood. While factors such as land use, street design, and demographics influence transport-related outcomes as well, the concept of clustering holds value for those interested in truly understanding transport networks and accessibility. 10.6 Meshedness Urban planners and engineers have long been interested in measuring street connectivity and typically do so with relatively simple measures. The link to node ratio, called beta, or the beta index in transport geography, divides the total number of links by the total number of nodes. In figure 10.7, the connected network has a link to node ratio of 1.6 while well, the dendritic network's link-to-node ratio is 1.0. A link-to-node ratio of 1.4 is typically considered a well-connected street network. The connected node ratio divides the number of connected nodes, nodes that are not dead ends, by total number of nodes. The networks in figure 10.7 have a connected node ratio of 1.0 and 0.6, respectively. The underlying intent is to distinguish between well-connected or gridded street networks and dendritic, tree-like networks, as highlighted in the figure. In researching relevant issues such as travel behavior, road safety, VMT, and public health outcomes. Topology takes a slightly different approach to understanding this issue. The meshedness coefficient, for instance, measures connectivity by looking at the number of cycles in the network with respect to the maximum number of cycles. A cycle is a closed path that begins and ends at the same node with no fewer than three links. A meshedness coefficient of zero represents full tree structure, no cycles, and one represents complete connectivity. Every node is directly connected to every other node. 
which is not feasible in a large surface transport network. In non-planar networks, this measure is also known as, in transport geography as alpha, or the alpha index. The alpha for the connected network above is 0.4, and for the dendritic network is just 0.03. For large networks, beta and alpha are highly correlated. Another useful measure is treeness. Instead of counting the number of cycles, treeness divides the length of street segments not within a cycle by the total length of street segments. Networks with good overall connectivity are called integrated networks. Networks with low connectivity are called fractured networks, although fractured networks can still be comprised of connected components. Again, these measures relate to issues of resilience. When a single node failure can significantly erode network functionality, the system is fragile. Figure 10.8 shows a fallen tree in Lake Oswego, Oregon, that cut off more than 50 families from the outside world, or more specifically, the cars of more than 50 households were trapped. If only that network had a little less treeness. 10.7. Treeness. Christopher Alexander asserts, a city is not a tree. That is true in some ways, yet the suburbs are certainly more tree-like than cities. Our students have measured the treeness of networks, the length of street segments not within a cycle by the total length of street segments. For instance, we see in figure 10.9 that treeness is not surprisingly higher at the suburban edges of the metropolitan area than in the center, though it declines as we see rural areas where the sparser network is also more mesh or grid-like. Many physical infrastructures are better configured as trees, especially if they require a large capital investment, like a wastewater treatment facility. Similarly, stream and river valleys are naturally organized as hierarchies. Transit networks are also often more tree-like or radial than roads, and while may eventually evolve into ring radial systems, don't generally start out that way. The Boston Transit Network in Figure 11.1, .1, for instance, looks very tree-like. 10.8 Resilience What investments should you make to keep your network online? Say you are charged with ensuring that your network keeps operating. It is constantly under threat, not just from terrorists, but also from long deterioration from lack of maintenance or the sudden onset of Mother Nature. If you lose connectivity, you will lose accessibility. Which links are most important to keep operating? Graph theory defines resilience such that if graph G has property P, what is the minimum number of edges, E, that need to be removed so that G no longer has P? For example, consider the graph on the left of figure 10.10 .10 and its resilience with respect to connectivity. Removing any one edge leaves a connected graph. It is necessary to remove two edges to produce a graph that is not connected, the middle figure. Thus, we could say that this graph has a resilience of 2 with respect to connectivity. Note that this does not mean that removing any two edges will destroy connectivity in this graph. The figure on the right demonstrates the possibility of removing two edges while leaving the graph connected. Under this definition, a given graph will have different values of resilience with respect to different properties. As a result, the definition is concrete but flexible, and can be usefully applied to real-world networks where properties are of variable importance from different perspectives. The example above highlights the difference between random edge removal and targeted edge removal. If edges are removed randomly, a property might survive the removal of many edges. Targeted edge removal implies that the graph is analyzed and edges are chosen to maximize effect. The effect on the network of either type of edge removal depends, in part, on degree substitution. Graphs following a power law distribution, scale-free, tend to be highly resilient to random edge removal because there is very good chance that the edges removed will connect only low degree vertices, and therefore the overall graph structure will be affected only slightly. Graphs are much more vulnerable, however, to targeted removal of edges attached to high degree nodes, especially to the removal of those nodes themselves. In scale-free graphs, these high degree vertices are critical in connecting subgraphs. A graph with a low resilience with respect to a property can lose that property as a result of only a few edge removals we can say that the graph is vulnerable with respect to that property. But this is only half of a complete consideration of vulnerability. The other half has to do with the effect on the network's performance if the property in question has been lost. In graph theory, resilience is a binary concept. An edge either exists or it does not. A graph either has a property or it does not. In real-world transport networks, links have additional properties such as capacity, utilization, demand, and cost. 10.9. Circuity. Circuity is the network distance between two points divided by the Euclidean or straight line distance and must be above the value of 1. The value of circuity varies for each origin destination pair and depends on the physical layout of the network. Grids don't do especially well in this measure. In the worst case, going from the southwest to the northeast corner of a square grid, geometry tells us the circuity would be about 1.41, the square root of 2. For a trip from the southwest to southeast corner or the southwest to northwest corner, the circuity would be a minimum value of 1. 
Radial networks reduce the circuity to downtown, but increase it substantially for some suburb-to-suburb -suburb trips. It is important to note, however, that people do not just accept poor circuity. They, in fact, choose their home with respect to their workplace on corridors with less circuity than random. People self-select homes and jobs that have more direct routes, lower circuity, to achieve better housing options in the same travel time, as rents are lower farther from the center. Circuity can help explain the mode choice of commuters. As shown in Figure 10.11, the circuity of transit networks is much higher than that of road networks, helping to explain the higher travel times of transit compared with the automobile, and thus the lower mode share. Transit is generally not operating on an efficient grid. The reasons for this are political. In the U.S., transit systems choose to expand their spatial coverage at the expense of directness and efficiency. Transit is especially inefficient for short trips. Transit circuity exponentially declines as travel time increases, in part because the long trips are more likely to be served by trains, which are much more difficult to divert than buses, for the political expediency of ensuring spatial coverage. On the highway side in the United States, overall circuity has increased between 1990 and 2010, Random points have not only become farther apart in distance, their shortest network path has become more circuitous, suggesting that the more recently constructed parts of street networks are laid out more circuitously than older parts of the network.